Next up, we have Ola and Minnie, who should be making their way. Ah, excellent. Um, we'll get their laptop set up. Um, I don't know how many of you know this, but I've spent a little bit of time working on responsive images. Just a, just a smidgen. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's such a relief and such a privilege to, to meet people who have spent as much time thinking about this stuff as I have, if not more. Um, and Ola and Mini uh, have had to tackle this for a very, very large organization at Walmart. Um, and are, is the slides not working? Where are we going? Ah, there we go. Excellent. So please welcome Ola and Mini. Hello, everyone. I'm Ola. And I'm Minnie. And we're both UX designers at Walmart Labs based out of San Francisco Bay Area. I work on the Walmart Labs standalone site. And I work on Walmart.com, the main Walmart site. Today, we'll be sharing with you some of the things we learned about hero images while making these sites fully responsive. So in early 2014, the UX team at Walmart Labs began planning the redesign of our sites. And one of the ch things that was challenging um, about this was figuring out how to des um, design for um, hero images. So what are hero images? Hero images are kind of like a billboard delivering a message to your customers. They're a way for people to emotionally engage with your site by conveying the spirit of your brand. They're generally a focal point of the page, and on responsive sites where the layout changes, it can be challenging to design images that work across breakpoints. The images generally have text on them, and simply shrinking text can make it unreadable. So if you think about it, take a movie poster and then try to shrink it down to the size of a pack of gum. So knowing the complexity and high stakes of getting things wrong when going responsive for the first time, we decided to start with a small project and a small t team to quickly iterate and, um, le and learn. So we chose Walmart Grocery, our standalone site. At the time, it had a small user base and a four-person UX team working on it. So this is what the site looks like. It was a desktop-only site with a, car with a hero carousel on the homepage that varied based on the market that um, we were targeting. So our team began working with a so-called responsive image expert from Cloud4 to help us figure out a solution. <laughs> So Jason ran some experiments to see where text, text became unreadable as things scaled. So based on that, um, he recommended three breakpoints, a medium, small, and large. And the final solution included one normal um, density image and one um, retina image. And he applied three um, unique aspect ratios to those images based on the breakpoint. So, Happy with this solution, we put together some guidelines um, so that the rest of the team could produce the images that were required. A few weeks later, I got a panicked email saying the number of images that the creative team had to produce was out of control. So we had gone from creating one hero image to now creating six images. And we now have to deal with three unique aspect ratios. And the added effort, there was the added effort to figure out um, art direction on the smaller um, images. And to make matters worse, the team hadn't considered the fact that images often change based on the um, market that we're serving. So let's, talk, let's see how we can, this thing is quickly got out of control. So just imagine we have three images to start to uh, match our three breakpoints. Now, if we're going to be serving um, retina displays, we're now at six. And each carousel typically has four images, so now we're at 24 images. And if you have, say, 20 markets, we're talking about 480 images that you have to account for. I wonder whose bright idea this was anyway. <laughs> In Jason's defense, um, everyone agreed to this in abstract, and there's a big difference between abstract and, real, uh, and putting things into practice. For instance, um, you, think, you typically think of this process as you create the image and then you upload it, but this isn't reality. 
In reality, what actually happens is you create the image, and then this passes through a series of processes, and it's managed by different teams. And to make things worse, um, we had to manu manually upload each image based on sort of the capability of our publishing tool at the time. So it was clear that we had to figure out a way to support multiple uh, image densities without sort of straining our, in uh, our internal team and our current um, infrastructure. So one of the things that I did was try to figure out how to um, come up with high quality images without um, sacrificing performance in an effort to sort of reduce the number of images. So my first idea was, what if we could just standardize on retina images? So I looked at all the devices that were sort of visiting our site and noticed that there was just a small fraction that were non-retina. So I said, let's get rid of the non-retina images. Now I know what you guys are thinking. Well, I can't swear I work for Walmart. <laughs> um, so I can tell you, let's sort of explain how this works. So just imagine started, um, starting with a uh, typical hero image and exporting out at um, 1x and 2x at a high JPEG compression of, say, like 80% quality. What you notice is the 2x image is um, twice the dimension of the 1x image and has a significantly um, larger file size. So what if we took that 2x image and we dropped the JPEG quality down to something like 10%? <laughs> what you notice is there's a significant drop in file size, but you also get a lot of artifacts. This image will look terrible on, on your screen at 100% of the natural um, size. But the good news is your customers won't see it, this terrible image because they'll only be getting um, this image displayed to them in half the natural size. And if you shrink it down, this image will look great and will work quite well on retina um, devices as well. So the thing is, it's really tough and it's not in uh, de most designers' um, instincts to sort of you know, compress things down to this um, low level of JPEG quality. And it was really hard convincing everyone. So, um, Mini, what, what do you think when I told you about this? <laughs> so, <laughs> Ola, you're a nice guy. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> uh, and for another designer, I literally stood over his shoulder and on, had to almost drag his, drag his hand to make him push that slider past 30%. <laughs> So what I had to do was create a responsive um, design demo, which allowed me to at least convince people that this could work. And what I would do in meetings, I would hand out devices with these very um, comp um, images, and I would ask them to tell me which one was um, a high density image or a normal one. And in most cases, they couldn't tell the difference. So without sort of creating this demo, it would have been really difficult to get the team, the creative team, to agree to put anything on a site that was at 10% compression level. So what I learned from this is it was, it's quite, um, there's quite an easy way to get great looking retina images at file sizes that approach the standard images that we were using before. And when it came down to it, it wasn't really about actual quality, it's about perceived quality. So my second idea was, why don't we just reduce the number of breakpoints? So we started out with three breakpoints. What I noticed when sort of working with the compressed retina images was that the largest image at the low quality setting was actually much smaller than the medium uh, image at the higher um, setting. So when sort of looking at the differences between the resolutions, I thought, why not simplify things and get rid of one breakpoint? So the last idea I had was to standardize the aspect ratios. So we started up with these three unique aspect ratios. And I thought, why not just standardize on the larger aspect ratio? And the thing about this is, this provided flexibility for designers to be able to basically take that large image and apply the design to a small image. And this works for most of the images that we produce. Um, and in the cases where they wanted to make some adjustments just to make the text more readable or for image focus, they could do that too, and that's okay. Um, Yes, we could probably have done this without having to do the aspect ratio changes, but doing this actually makes everyone's lives much easier. 
So in the end, after multiple iterations and working with the team, we were able to go from six images to two, two images per hero. And for those 480 images for those 20 markets, we went down to about 160 images per market. So the team was happy. <laughs> uh, so basically, after making the Walmart, um, Walmart grocery uh, responsive, it was now time for the company to go responsive across the board. And as fate would have it, the person sitting across the cube from me was ready to make that happen for Walmart.com. Oops. So as you probably know, Walmart's a tiny company. <laughs> and the site only has 7 million products, 500 department pages, and the team about to tackle going responsive had a mere 40 UX designers. We had an adaptive desktop site and a separate M website. In February, the decision was made to phase out the M website, and the desktop code was to become fully responsive. Because the site had recently been redesigned, starting from scratch wasn't an option, so we had to do everything we could to keep the same features and functionality across all devices and have one-to-one -one parity. And we had to do all of this by June. <laughs> so the breakpoints were quickly defined and a grid was set up, and we all just split up and worked in parallel. I was tasked with figuring out the creative images, and I didn't know what I was getting into, so I kind of just had to jump right in. The first thing was to look at what was currently being done. So we had a homepage and department page, and each of them had heroes and banners on it, but they were actually different sizes between pages. So this meant that if there was one story being told on multiple pages, we actually needed separate images. Plus, these were each designed and maintained by separate teams. And then there was the MWeb homepage hero, which was another image, and that was a completely other different team. <laughs> <laughs> so when you unpack all that, you've got one story being designed for several different scenarios by several different designers and several different production and merchandising teams. That's expensive for any company, but when you think about the scale of Walmart, those numbers are huge. Think about the duplication for one story, and then think about this for over 600 stories. And we're talking about, for the responsive site, not just launching brand new stories for June, we're talking about redoing all of the existing content on the entire site. And this was a lot of work in a short time frame, so we really needed to keep the number of files and the workload as low as possible. It was important that the graphic designers could repurpose their files to minimize the impact that this was going to have on their team. So I had an idea. If the creative team is already streamlining some of the heroes to work for MWeb, couldn't we just use a streamlined graphic on all of the breakpoints? And then we could just use one image everywhere. So I started with the banners first. I knew it was going to be a little bit more complicated to figure out how this part of the page might change. And I had this idea to use a graphic that was set up in a title safe design, so the, crop, the sides would crop as the page width changed. And if you haven't heard of title safe, it's this idea used in film where all the important content's actually more towards the center of the screen so that nothing gets cut off when it's played back on different displays. And so for our images, I needed to figure out some column widths that would allow this to work. So I took all of our five breakpoints and I laid out what I'm calling the low and the high end of each breakpoint so we could understand how these things would actually transform. So for example, if you have a breakpoint at 320 and then the next one up is 480, I needed to see how the image would crop at 320 and I needed to see how it would transform all the way up to 479, which was just before the next breakpoint came in. So I envisioned what it would, the space needed for having a banner with text and a photo on it. And then I tried about a million combinations of column setups that seemed like they'd be a decent width. I had to think about how the page would stack between desktop and mobile, and also for the desktop pages with and without a left rail. And then I'd finally narrowed it down to a column pattern that I thought might work. And using vector boxes was a good starting point to get the column set up, but in order to really figure out the dimensions of the banners, I needed to use actual graphics. So I created these images with cropping guides on it so I could see how it would fill each space. And I also made some sample banners so I could really see um, if text and a photo would look good with different crops on it. And of course, this wasn't just for the homepage. It was for the department page and literally every other breakpoint. I was noticing when doing this that some of the breakpoints actually had a much wider cha drastic change um, in the width, and this was actually going to cause problems for our title graphics because the image would have needed to be more of a um, long horizontal image. So I had this idea. 
if we could crop the image at the low end of the breakpoint, maintain that scrop, crop and scale it up a bit, we could then reveal the whole width and it would fill the entire breakpoint. And again, this still felt all fine and dandy in theory, but I really wanted to see it moving to make sure what I was envisioning was gonna work. I needed to work with a developer to build a prototype, so I reached out to Eric from Cloud4. And it was a really good thing that I did this, because it turns out the way that I was envisioning everything adjusting as the breakpoints got wider was not actually possible to do. So we experimented with code to see what our options were. We did several iterations, and in one of them there was a breakpoint that looked pretty awesome. So I actually sat with my face two inches from my monitor. I dragged the browser wider one pixel at a time, and I was taking notes on how the image was transforming. And as it turned out, if we actually flipped the order from what I was envisioning, we created a system that would work across all the different breakpoints. And for the heroes, I applied the same system so that we didn't have a disconnect of behaviors on the site. I took the same approach to uh, figuring out the responsive containers, and this time I had to factor in where the UI elements would go for the carousel slider. And since these are hero images, it was really important that the creative team could still have fun designing to let the spirit of the brand shine through for the customer. I used the title saved concept to um, define the usable areas inside the UI elements, and having some of this structure actually helped create a common thread that would help these graphics feel harmonious across pages. So before responsive design, the team was creating 5,500 images to support desktop and MWeb. If we would continued in this direction, we would have needed at least 10,000 images just to get to parity on MWeb, and that's not even responsive. In most responsive design projects, you end up increasing the number of images to support multiple breakpoints. And if Griggs had designed this, who knows how many images we would have needed. <laughs> but instead, we actually reduced the number from where we started, supported five breakpoints, and most importantly, we only had one hero and one banner for the creative team to design. We kept the spirit of the brands, and we created an elegant experience for the customer that would work on any device. So despite solving our responsive hero images in different ways, there were some common themes that we faced. The first thing was, when it comes to images, it's really about the people in their workflow and not just about the web technology. The challenge relates to how many images the creative team needs to make and how they get those images into production and up onto the site. So the people being affected by responsive design aren't often the ones you think of first. We tend to think of designers and developers who spend a lot of time creating these sites. But there are plenty of other teams like merchandising and QA that are affected. So make sure that you think of all these people that need to be part of the conversation before you get started. And for responsive hero images, it's really important to have a good collaboration between UX and creative. I've been in the shoes of a creative who's been given a box by UX and told a graphic has to go inside of it. I had no idea the purpose of the box, and they had no idea that the box is actually a really difficult space to design for. When building these systems, the creative team is our customer, and it's important for us to understand how they envision their designs in this space and what it takes to get the work done. We're building a system to meet their needs. So another thing we learned is the value of prototyping and experimentation for both of us it was important that we test our theories using prototypes. A big lesson in, is that responsive sites aren't static designs. They are fluid, and it's important to see them moving. And finally, while we've been talking about hero images at a huge scale, these challenges are something that any organization will face. You may not have a zillion images on your site, but you still have people. And the people in your organization who need to make and maintain those images will thank you if you take the time to understand what their process is and understand how to build solutions that are maintainable and have the ability to scale with your organization. Thank you very much. Thank you.